All right, it's after 2.30, so maybe we'll just start, and if people keep popping in, that's quite okay. okay. So, yeah, welcome, everyone. Um, it's good to see you all again. Um, before we do start, we just um, will acknowledge um, that the land of the university is situated on the land from the Wajuk, Wajuk Noongar people. Uh, we acknowledge them as the traditional custodians, and we pay our respects to them, their elders past and present. Um, so this week, we will welcome Lucas, Lucas Fort, and he's presenting um, his PhD research. Last week, he did present some initial findings, so today we get to hear the lot, the complete story. We're looking forward to it, Lucas. Okay, yeah. Um, Lucas has been supervised by Lynn Parker, um, Park Greg, as they like to call him, and Glenn Savage. Um, hopefully they're here. If they are, we welcome them. The title of his presentation is Making Indonesia Clean, the Role of Culture in the Development of Circular Economy-Based Waste Management Services in Sumbawa, Indonesia. So thank you, Lucas. Over to you. Thank you, Dorinda, for introduction. And okay, so I'm going to do the, 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 the share, share my screen now. Yes, please. Share screen. I should be on. Yeah, that's good. Thank right. you. Okay, perfect. Oh, let me get to the slide. Slide mode. Oh, I can already. Okay. Okay. Uh, good afternoon, everyone, and thank you uh, for being here. Uh, uh, Dorinda already introduced me, so I'm just gonna go straight to the topic of my presentation, which is a. Uh, which is ab uh, about my PhD project that focuses on the development of new waste management services in Indonesia. More specifically, it looks at the role of culture in the conceptualization and operationalization of waste management policy based on circular economy principles and enacted as part of a roadmap to make Indonesia clean from waste by 2025. The project provides an ethnographic account of developments in waste management infrastructure and waste-related education on the island of Sumbawa in eastern Indonesia. The project is now in the, in the dual analytic uh, slash writing up phase, which means that I have now completed the, the fieldwork component and, uh, and that I can share some uh, initial findings and arguments with you today. I should note that my fieldwork uh, was interrupted uh, thanks to the, the event of the pandemic and was cut, cut short from 12 to 6 months. Uh, <clears throat> before I move on, I should acknowledge that my fieldwork in Indonesia has been enabled thanks to the permission from the Indonesian Ministry of Research and Technology and thanks to the bureaucratic assistance and academic support from the University of Mataram in Lombok. Last but not least, I would also like to take the opportunity to extend my gratitude to my three supervisors, Lynn Parker, Greg Achille, and Glenn Savage for their great supervision and continued support and advice. Uh, the key background of the project is, is the fact that Indonesia is ranked as the world's second biggest marine polluter. What I intend to do with uh, with this in my in, what I intend to do in uh, in this presentation is to interrogate some of the key factors. Uh, that make this leakage of waste possible and to discuss how efforts to mitigate the situation could be improved. But first, I'd like to read you a short extract from my thesis introductory chapter. It's only two paragraphs long and it describes everyday forms of waste disposal in Sumbawa as I encounter them or observe them during a bus journey through the island. By reading this, I hope to give you a more vivid description of the waste crisis uh, that Indonesia faces today, and to invite you to think about the factors that enable this crisis to occur. So I couldn't find a better picture, but this uh, represents a view from uh, from a bus. There was a there was there was only a handful of passengers on the bus as we left the station and started to meander along the coastline and sometimes further inland. The land next to the road was dried and yellow from the scorching sun that refused to allow the rainy season. To in the two seats across the aisle from me was a middle woman who fed her two children with meatballs covered in tomato sauce. As I looked through the window behind her, I noticed a woman with a child parking her motorcycle next to a cliff where she skillfully tied the used nappy inside a plastic bag and then, with a swing worthy of an Olympic athlete, threw the matter into the sea. 
I kept looking out of the window, thinking about a friend of mine who just the day before had invited me on a short trip from his house to a nearby landfill where he regularly dumps his family's household waste. My thoughts were interrupted by a male bus conductor who invited me for a conversation. I've been in Sumbawa for six months now, and I do research on waste management here. I answer this question about what had brought me to the island. The conversation was paused when the woman sitting across the aisle from me started to shout Kiri Kiri, so as to indicate that we had now reached her destination. As the bus stopped, the mother dropped all her snack and meal bowl packaging onto the floor and then helped her children off the bus. Having said thank you and goodbye to her, the bus conductor went straight to her seat to clean up the waste she had left behind. After a couple of minutes had passed, the picked up rubbish was still in his hands. I wondered whether it had something to do with me, that he had yet, yet to throw it away. It did not. He was just more aware of his surroundings than I was. The banks of the road where, along which we were driving were still covered with houses. So he was waiting until the bus had reached the bridge at the edge of the village, from where it was more appropriate to dispose of the waste. With that rubbish now in its place, I opened my notebook and started to make some notes until the bus was forced to slow down due to some congestion on the road. Looking out from the window, I noticed a young couple parking their motorcycle next to an Oxbow Lake formed out of household waste, household waste at the side of the road. They stopped there to dispose of their rubbish. I could see packaging from cooking oil as well as used nappies all stuffed inside a large plastic bag that the young woman held in her hand as she stepped down from the motorbike. They then engaged in some argument from which I was excluded by the window on the left. This, however, did not stop me from imagining what this quarrel was about. I thought to myself that the guy said to his wife to throw the waste in the river instead, to which I imagined she then replied that it would be better to throw it here because then the authorities might one day be able to collect it and take it to a nearby landfill. End of text. I hope that my reading was clear enough for you to have been able to join me on the bus there uh, on that day in Sumbawa and to imagine why Indonesia is ranked as the world's second biggest marine polluter. Well, Indonesia is an archipelago of 17,000 islands, 6,000 of which are inhabited and home to approximately 270 million people. The practices described in the anecdote are not unique to Sumbawa nor to public transportation. Instead, they could be observed to varying degree across different spheres of social life and in all corners of the nation. The common narrative about marine pollution is based on the techno-political assumption that waste can and should be managed. If that is so, then the leakage of waste into the environment is nothing but a symptom of ineffective waste management services. This pathology is often diagnosed for low or middle income countries where at least two billion people still do not have access to basic waste collection services. Indeed, what I wanted from the anecdote was for us to consider the leakage of waste into the environment in Indonesia as one of the unintended consequences of modernity, which include the rapid spread of retail infrastructure and the resulting shifts in consumption practices from biodegradable to plastic materials, and of course, the failure or unwillingness to meet these transformations with necessary developments in waste management infrastructure and waste-related education. <clears throat> this is provided at the level of municipality in, in Indonesia have historically used the linear collect transport dump scheme that make that means uh, taking uh, transporting uh, waste from the bin to the landfill. Landfills in Indonesia are mainly open dump sites which means that waste deposited there is not secluded from the environment. The main reasons why majority of people don't have access to such is because they don't live in the catchment area or their houses are not located next to the main roads. When excluded from such service, people often have to dump their waste into the river or the ocean, depending on their location. They also make their own dump site, often outside of their community, like the couple in the anecdote I read earlier, or they simply burn or bury their waste where they live. The socio Environmental consequences of their, of their practices are too numerous. I should just note that they cause damage to marine ecosystems, affect the health of those living on uh, river banks, and generate toxic, uh, toxic emissions. The practices of littering and open incineration also result in lost opportunities for resource recovery. In other words, it devalues, it devalues, if not destroys, the materials that could otherwise be reused or recycled. In Indonesia, recycling, where it happens, has historically been enabled by the highly stigmatized informal waste pickers who collect waste from the environment, often from landfills, rivers, urban areas, or directly from households. 
The turning point for waste management in Indonesia was the 2005 tragedy when a wall of waste from a landfill in West Java collapsed on surrounding houses, resulting in a death of around 150 people. This tragedy attracted, attracted attention, gathered momentum and called for action that resulted in the enactment of the country's first national waste management law. As you can see on the slide, this regulation was intended to change the country's waste management into more integrated system that incorporates collection, sorting, recycling, and waste processing. To that end, the regulation adopted the concept of integrated solid waste management, and as a result, introduced for the first time the idea of waste reduction. Excuse me. Integrated solid waste management consists of three dimensions. The first recognizes the system's diverse stakeholders and the importance of cooperation between them. The second dimension refers to the practical and technical elements of the waste system itself. As you can see from this slide, uh, this dimension acknowledges that waste reduction has equal weight to the high profile elements of collection, transfer, disposal or treatment. In this sense, integrated waste management system is not just about physical infrastructure or the build things that move and transform other things, but also about efforts to reduce or limit waste in the first place. And the final dimension refers to the aspects of the local context that should be taken into account when designing and assessing such systems. What this dimension shows us is that waste management systems are not undergird by elements integral to the technology itself, such as roads, vehicles, staff, and technology instead, or energy. Instead, they are amalgams of financial, technical, socio-cultural, environmental, and institutional elements. All of theirs have to be engaged simultaneously for the system to operate effectively or sustainably and sustainably. The aim of the 2008 national law was to encourage recycling at the household level, replace open dumping into sanitary landfill and improve the overall service provisions. However, the expected results have not been achieved. Although waste materials have the capacity to compel us to act, sustain attention or effective attention to waste is rather difficult to achieve. While integrated approach may be the suitable model for Asian countries to adopt, there are many challenges that hinder its application in Indonesia. Using the integrated system's own assessment model, we can conclude that the problem of ineffective waste management in Indonesia is not just about insufficient roads, vehicles, staff, and waste treatment facilities, nor just about inadequate financial resources, lack of coordination, and weak law enforcement, but also about low public awareness and participation. When we take these challenges and put them into the context of Asian urbanization, economic and population growth, increased consumption and socio-economic inequalities, what we are left with is a perfect storm. Given the background, given this background, in 2017, the government of Indonesia adopted presidential decree on the management of solid waste. This is also known as an action plan to make Indonesia clean from waste by 2025. The dual aim of this regulation is to reduce solid waste from, from its source by 30% and to properly handle at least 70% of the country's solid waste by 2025. Properly handle, in this case, means avoiding unsanitary landfilling. This is important given that many of the open dump sites in Indonesia are currently nearing their capacity. What the government hopes to do here is to not only make its waste management more integrated, as, uh, as we discussed earlier, but also more circular by adopting the universally popular anti-waste strategy known as circular economy. Unlike the dominant linear model, circular economy recognizes that natural resources are finite. Waste management system based on uh, circular economy therefore aim to reduce waste by keeping materials in circulation for as long as possible. There are three key principles in circular economy. The first one is to design for zero waste. In other words, uh, to eliminate waste and pollution through design and the use of materials that are either renewable or can be restored or regenerated. Second is to keep materials in, in use for as long as possible through strategies such as reuse, repair, remanufacture, recycle, or even share. And the third is to regenerate natural system, for example, through composting. The current efforts behind circular economy, I believe, should be considered as internal to our, to our current economic and environmental crises. With respect to the former, circular economy provides opportunity and means for commodification of materials not previously considered in terms of their value 
economic one. With regard to the latter, the environmental crisis, circular economy is often seen as a way to mitigate climate change by reducing our carbon footprint. Circular economy is a transformative concept and the transition to circular economy will require changes to existing modes and forms of waste management. This includes the development of new waste collection streams and processing facilities. In Indonesia, policymakers often note that this cannot be done by the government alone. In other words, infrastructural provisions will have to be met with radical behavioral changes that result in greater public participation and awareness. I think, <clears throat> excuse me, I think we all agree that the issue of waste cannot be solved by technology alone and that greater cultural changes are indeed needed. I am sure we also agree that waste should be a collectively shared matter of concern, if not the thing of the past. And yet I find something troubling or worthy of our attention in these assertions. First, public infrastructures such as waste management, water supply, sanitation and public transportation have historically not been the priorities for the government in Indonesia. The question is, will, will, will it be this time? The second issue that I have is about the free market or, or rational choice theory assumption that the economic value of waste itself can change people's attitudes. It is important to remind ourselves that waste is not only something that compels us to act, whether in the face of mortal peril or in pursuit of increased utility. Waste is also a stigmatizing and structuring concept. In this sense, waste does not have to exist in nature for it to be able to order or shape our lives. So when we talk about circular economy as a way to make Indonesia clean from waste, we are also talking about radical transformation of existing social and socio-material relations, namely those between state and society and between people and their waste materials. The way to think about this possible transformations critically is by considering the role of culture. To use culture to probe this transformation is important because the cleaning and waste avoiding practices that appear to deal with objective ecological concerns are in fact cultural, as well as central to maintaining power structures. As Douglas' study of purity and danger reminds us, when there is dirt, there is a system. This statement, as we know, can also be reversed, so that where there is a system, there is dirt, or something that is being systematically devalued or excluded. When we put this into the context of development of new waste management services, we could, be, we could well be talking about exclusion of certain stakeholders and the rejection of specific waste materials and different types of knowledge, practices, and concern. Here, I suggest that using culture allows the study to consider the push towards circular economy as a form of an assemblage, assemblage or a system of disparate elements. One way to inter investigate systems is to study what they exclude and reject. Another way is to look at their emergent effects, for example, their ability to shape social behavior and ethical disposition. My project has two distinct yet interconnected aims. First is to examine the role of culture in their developments, and the second is to in investigate how their developments could be made more environmentally and socially just. To address their aims, the project uses uh, primary data from a six months long ethnographic field work conducted on the island of Sumbawa in Western Nusa Tenggara province. This administrative area also includes the better known island of Lombok, you can see on the left. The government of this province is currently undertaking its own waste management program based on the aspiration to make Indonesia clean from waste by 2025. The fieldwork was undertaken around the multiscalar and socio-technical domain of waste management infrastructure. This included all stages of formal and informal waste processing and numerous sites of environmental and waste-related learning. I also followed the waste materials produced on the island. island. This led me to the island of Java, where all recyclables from Sumbawa and other parts of Indonesia are transported for recycling. It is important to note that Sumbawa is divided into four administrative districts which means that there are four formal bodies or agencies responsible for waste management on the island. Here, for the, for the purpose of the presentation, I, I represent data as if originating from one waste management ecosystem. In addition to field work, the project also relied on a textual analysis of national policy documents and regulatory framework related to uh, this development. 
I tried to make a map uh, that would represent the uh, waste management system in Sumbawa and which would uh, identify the diverse sites and stakeholders of my multi-sited research. Uh, so let us start from the yellow box on the left of con uh, consumers. Here my interlocutors included rural and urban dwellers with and without access to municipal waste collection. Most of my research here focused on consumption and waste management practices across the spheres of household and communal life. The handling of waste at the household level is done predominantly by women, regardless of location or ethnicity. As you can imagine, it was not always possible or easy to talk to people about their waste management practices. It's not only because the waste is stigmatizing, but also because there is nothing useful in waste if we are respectful of the word, word's etymology. People, in general, prefer to talk about something that produces value. However, acts of cleaning and waste separating, as well as recycling, are indeed productive of value. So there were plenty of opportunities for me to have free-flowing conversations about waste during my fieldwork. My informants also included municipal waste truck drivers who bring waste to the landfill. Rubbish they collect from households is never separated. This is left for waste pickers working on the light landfill to do. However, some truck drivers do indeed sort and sell the waste they collect from households before they dump the rest at the landfill. That way they can earn extra money, for example, for cigarettes, which are cheap in Indonesia. In many ways, their work allows them to cross institutional boundaries between formal and informal spheres. Waste pickers working on the, on the landfill in my field sites were predominantly women from a nearby village of Sasak migrants from Lombok. The waste they retrieve from the landfill is sold to waste collectors in the nearby town. I made numerous visits to the landfill. However, I would not dare to say that what I did there was a participant observation. In that particular environment, observation alone is a challenge. As you can see from the map, another option that some people in Sumbawa now have are waste banks and the so-called TPS, uh, TPS collection facilities. Waste banks are community-based waste collection points where people can sell their recyclable waste. They can be located in urban neighborhoods, in villages, or even in schools. Base banks are either private or semi-private. The concept of base bank is not new, but their establishment is now being seen as a crucial for the objective, sorry, yeah, for the objective of waste reduction across the nation. According to the head of the Ministry of Environment and Forestry, base banks are the key manifestation of the new circular economy paradigm. According to the ministry, there are currently around 7,500 base banks and 2, 209,000 customers in Indonesia. You can see two customers uh, there on the slide. The, the, the three R's TPS collection points are part of municipal waste management systems. They are built to collect and sort out waste from local neighborhoods. Waste that cannot be recirculated at the facility is then sent into the landfill. Although built by the municipality, this facility is operated by local environmental groups or organizations. In addition to reducing waste, there's two types of facilities are obliged to collect data for the government. As you can imagine, the plan to make Indonesia clean from waste will require lots of data. Not necessarily accurate data, but data nonetheless. In this sense, waste banks are not only collecting and trading with waste, but also with data. Waste, banks oper waste bank operators often collect only plastic that can be recycled meaning that other more harmful materials continue to be at the risk of polluting the environment. Therefore, waste banks should not be seen as substitutes for, for the equal access to waste collection services. Also, the exchange rate for recyclable plastic is rather low, which means that many people continue to let others sort out their waste. The prices for recyclables are low because both waste banks and the three R collection points have to sell their waste to local collectors to local collectors rather than selling directly to Java to recycling companies. Low price and the stigma associated with recycling means that some operators of these facilities are not interested in collecting recyclable waste. In other words, collecting and selling plastic waste is a trade of the informal sector, or as some even put it, of those without education. Instead of systematic collection of waste from the local areas, some operators focus on the production of compost 
or the invention of various products out of plastic waste. This, of course, is in line with the principles of circular economy. However, the problem that people often encounter here is in finding a market for these products. To return back to the map, you can see there is also a facility called Parent, parent Based Bank. This facility is not yet in operation. However, the intention is to have one of these in each district. When established, other waste banks would then be able to sell their, sell their recyclable waste there instead of having to go to waste collectors. You can see this by following the red arrows on the map. Even though this is not possible at this stage, given the lack of established waste routes between the formal sector and the recycling companies in Java, the planning to bypass the informal sector is a clear, clearly intended to make Indonesia not only clean from waste, but also from the informal sector. Moreover, this would also provide opportunity for more data being generated and circulated through the formal sector. Here we can see how the idea of clean lines is closely intertwined with notions of control and order, or even purity, when we, take, when we think of data, data's credibility. In terms of the ways that ends up being unmanaged, regular cleanup events are being held across Indonesia. Thus, normative activities have a long history in Indonesia. They were held on every Friday during Suharto's era, and they are now making a strong comeback in Sumbawa. Collective waste from the environment often results in the collected waste being burned. This is often easier than arranging for a pickup truck or even waiting for the truck to arrive. In other words, burning uh, open incineration is often seen as the, as, the most, as the most efficient way to reduce waste in Indonesia. We can say that the main concern of these events, these cleanup activities, is about social cohesion or the spirit of mutual help and cooperation. Cleanups are also used in formal schooling as part of character education introduced by President Jokowi as part of his mental revolution. The aim of this revolution is to revive the character of the nation by addressing negative behavioral and cultural traits that Indonesian policymakers have long patronized and identified as main obstacles to development. <clears throat> in terms of cleanup activities, students are not only taught to practice clean lines in their schools or around mosques, they often also visit nearby beaches or other nature areas to do cleaning, as you can see on the image. It has to be noted that there is a great potential in cross -curricular, for cross-curricular learning in these events. For example, students could survey a certain area, categorize and classify waste that they collect there, and then they could identify the source of leakage and discuss possible solutions. However, these opportunities are never explored. Or as some educators note, the key here is to help the government in effort to make Indonesia clean and to teach students the value of integrity, religious piety, work ethic, and mutual co cooperation. In other words, what, in other words, this is less about uh, students learning about waste and more about uh, being taught how not to become one. The President Djokovic's emphasis on work ethic, innovation, and the use of tools and machinery is something that can be also seen in the current efforts to deal with the crisis of waste. For local commentators, circular economy provides opportunity for waste to be turned into new products of value. To tap into the opportunity that waste provides, people are told they need machines. It is with the help of tools and machines that waste can be turned into gold or a blessing, or more accurately into energy, roads, fabric, and other products. The desire to find a philosopher's stone or to turn waste into a beautiful product of high economic value, as one of my informant noted, can of course result in more waste being produced. In addition to pollution and other residue, here we can also talk about wasted trainings and labor, lost opportunities or ignored skills and knowledge. However, we have to be cautious when, we, when designated death as waste. As my research shows, the efforts to recirculate materials are not just about preventing materials going into the landfill. They are also about sociality, sharing knowledge, feeling fulfilled and part of community. In this instance, what I hope to demonstrate here is that waste management systems like other infrastructures, but also the efforts to deal with the current crisis of waste have both social and technical aspects, and that it is not always clear when one ends and the other begins. This is most evident in the way that efforts to reduce waste in Indonesia are being conflated with efforts to address what some commentators refer to as moral, moral crisis. The, result of my, the results of my research revealed that the opening of new waste collection streams is not envisioned by planners with the informal waste collection sector in mind, 
Also, the efforts to increase participation through programs recognizing the economic value of waste show little signs of uptake. This is largely because economic motives are often secondary to social group behavior and cultural standards in regard to the clean that determine people's attitudes to waste. Furthermore, dominant cultural frameworks of clean lines are concerned predominantly with social environments, resulting in the decoupling of ecological concerns from waste management efforts. This undervalues the role of environmental or waste-related education and overstates the significance of religious and free market indoctrination for programs designed to increase recycling and change everyday behavior related to waste. This also impacts on how sustainability is conceptualized in the more technical domain of waste management infrastructure, for example, in the propagation of waste to energy technologies. When socio-political and cultural issues are neglected, planning for new waste management services based on circular economy models does not only produce waste and rebound effects, but also naturalizes state society configurations within which the state is not obliged to provide infrastructural services. Reducing waste and increasing public participation through programs emphasizing the economic value of waste and the moral significance of clean lines cannot, I believe, be the substitutes for the need to shrink material throughput, reduce pollution, provide quality education, and ensure equal access to waste collection services. And that's all for me. Maybe I went too fast, as is always the case. Thank you. Thank you, Lucas. Thank you for that. That was lovely. I'll stop sharing. Yes, please. Thank you. So we will um, open the space up for some questions now. Um, maybe I do have two screens here of participants. So maybe if you can use the blue hand, because then I will, the, your name will come up on the side and I'll be able to easily find you. So that will probably be the easiest way for us to do this. And then we'll just go through the questions one by one. Tine. Uh, well, uh, thank you very much, Lucas. Uh, it's very inspiring. <laughs> uh, I have two questions for you. Uh, first, uh, is there any uh, CSR program there, uh, corporate uh, so social uh, responsibility, uh, which involve with waste management? And secondly, uh, who is the agent there? I mean. Is there any special role for, from uh, special people to improve the awareness of this uh, waste management? So it's uh, kind of the motor to change uh, public awareness and also uh, what culture in that uh, area, even though in, 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 a, in a very limited uh, scope. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks for an open question. Should I answer right away? Yes. Yes, please. Uh, yeah, okay. Uh, thank you for the question. Uh, in terms of social responsibility, as I talk about the waste banks, uh, uh, they are now being a part of the, the government program. Uh, they have to adhere to, uh, they have to provide something uh, for, the, for the community where they work. So often they, they can uh, employ unemployed. Often it is to provide jobs for the unemployed. So again, as I noted earlier, that the efforts to address waste are more concerned with the social environment. So uh, it's the same. It's the same with this. It's less. It's less to do with the cleaning or 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 making sure that waste doesn't go to the landfill than it is to to uh, to provide a set a safe social uh, environment in which these waste banks are located. Uh, Gotong Royong, uh, mutual help. Is a big, uh, is an important concept in Indonesia. So it's the same cleaning, uh, doing the communal work in terms of uh, cleaning up is also related to this. Uh, in in terms of the new policy, the 2017 policy, there's also uh, mention of producer responsibility. If I'm not mistaken, what it's called, it's basically uh, instructing uh, producers uh, to reduce their waste. To, to try and to find a ways how to minimize minimize packaging or to buy, uh, make packaging recyclable and so on, but it's not yet um, in law. Uh, there's no penalties or there's no targets that it has to be achieved uh, in, by a certain time and certain uh, certain volume. In terms of the public awareness, uh, I just mentioned the cleanup activities, but also my my research also looked into socialization programs, 
So again, a uh, famous concept in Indonesia, it's based on um, um, authorities going to, to uh, in this case, to consumers or households uh, and, and explaining to them what methods they could, they could or strategies they could use to achieve certain goals. As socialization could also be uh, top down in a sense, just you know, authorities will come and say, you need to do this, you need to re relocate from the landfill, for example. This is, uh, at some point, this is going to happen in Indonesia where, where informal sector, informal waste pickers will be asked to leave the landfill or to cooperate with the, with the government. So socializa socialization could be one direction like this. Uh, in terms of the effectiveness of what is being taught in, uh, in this, during this uh, programs, Again, it's, I don't have a data to assess the effectiveness of it, but from my observation, uh, you could see, again, it's, it's, it's also about ticking boxes saying that we did this uh, in, in, a, in a village A, we interacted with a number of people, and everybody gets a bit of money for participation, and, and pictures are taken at the end as evidence that something was, was achieved. What I'm trying to also argue in this, in this, in this, in my thesis is that education alone can't change this uh, the situation that we are in, and and people need to be uh, provided with uh, real material assistance, not just saying, you know, you need to recycle, but then there's no uh, nowhere for them to 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 dispose of that recycle uh, recycled material. If that answers your questions. So not much, basically, not much, not much going on there in terms of, in terms of changing uh, uh, the uh, public awareness. Okay, thank you. Thanks for that. Um, does anyone else have a question? I'm looking on the side here. I don't see any hands raised. Don't see anyone waving either. Oh yes. Okay, Loretta. Um, thanks very much, Lucas. Really such important work. Um, I actually couldn't hear your presentation very well, but um, I wanted to ask you and, you, and forgive me if you covered it already, um, how is the problem framed? Um, why, how is the problem understood in, in terms of the sort of local emic narrative, if you like, why there is a problem with um, waste or um, pollution, um, you know, um, in the environment. Thank you for getting to my rescue here, Loretta. I'm sorry. That you, I'm sorry that you couldn't hear it. I, I, I can't hear myself given the presentation, so I, I, I couldn't. Tell. Sorry for that. Um, in terms of your question, how it is framed, I think it's very schizophrenic uh, in a way it is framed by, okay, you asked me about the, um, the local perception, but uh, from, the, from the government perspective, um, they're trying to do two things. Uh, first, they represent the problem as a, or based as a monster, okay, that needs to be deal with. There's also a popular narrative about it, enters into uh, school brochures and so on, and also some uh, video games and applications. So. On one hand, we have a, a waste as a monster that needs to be defeated, but on the other hand, we have this uh, free market um, uh, representation of waste as a as a blessing, okay, or as a, as the economic value. So I, I see some uh, problem with that. Uh, if if you if you designate something as a blessing, there's no need to to to, to manage it, right? Uh, in terms of how how people kind of deal with it. Or how they perceive it, to try to understand it. The, the, the most common uh, response you're going to hear from, for example, villagers or even people in a town. It's not it's not a problem of village people in a village, but often you're going to hear is it's it's someone else's problem. It comes it comes from the river or it comes from the uh, from the sea. You know, so nobody wants to admit that it's actually. Uh, the homegrown issue, and I think that's the problem of the government as well. When, when on the one hand they talk about a monster that lives in a valley and suddenly appears, and then we talk about uh, waste as a as a opportunity, then I think they're uh, giving out the wrong message. I think 
you, you need to confront uh, the problem at some point. Uh, and yeah, and it's also, but I think it's, it, it can, I think it also, the, the scale of it, it is a monster. So it kind of escape any, any way, any form to kind of uh, create some, some techno-political narrative around it because the infrastructure that Indonesia is now is not equipped to deal with it, but also the efforts to deal with it now will be will be inefficient in in two years' time because uh, consumption increases uh, dramatically there. So, yeah, I think there's a lot of confusion about how to how to frame it as well. Yeah, thank you. Um, so there's not like a um, dominant narrative about people themselves being responsible. Uh, as a, yeah yes yeah okay so the, the 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 common narrative to deal with it and that's what i'm also trying to explore in my research that's why i'm talking about uh, that's why i talk about culture but i didn't uh, explore it here people often would say it's it's the problem of mentality so yes they would address it's 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 actually their problem they wouldn't say it's my problem uh, personally but they would say it's it's a problem of mentality and i think that 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 comes with the uh, here comes the the thing that I want to explore, which is uh, how policymakers or policymakers in the field of development uh, understand uh, Indonesian culture. So it is the view of uh, the Indonesian view of of its own culture that is often anti-developmental, that it um, doesn't think of the future, uh, doesn't save uh, people, don't save money, don't think of their future. Of course, that's not the case, but that's the view of of the elite and and yeah and and then you would have a so people would would say two things they would say it's a it's a problem of mentality but then they would also say it's a, it's the responsibility of government so they kind of share the responsibility they say it's on one hand government on the other hand it's it's our mentality but no one seems to ever mention the word infrastructure <laughs> and that's I, I, I find quite interesting they say yes government needs to do something about it but infrastructure is not the word. I mean, I, I come from communist Czechoslovakia, so you know, uh, public services and uh, and so on is is, I mean, was important for my generation in Indonesia. They they choose a different narrative, a more kind of neoliberal, uh, free market oriented. So uh, the lack of public infrastructure there, at least as I see it, may be the one reasons why infrastructure is just not 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 the word. Are you happy with that, Loretta? I could follow up, but I, there are other hands, so yeah, I won't. Right, we'll do those first, shall we? And if we have time, we'll get back to you. Um, Sukri. Uh, thank, thank you. Thank you. Uh, my question actually quite similar to uh, Loretta's questions. Uh, and I'm sorry to drag you to my topic uh, again, uh, <laughs> Lucas, because I want to ask, uh, did you have a chance to check the, the the, the process of loving uh, village development uh, planning and budgeting because uh, I just check in uh, some of the document like uh, the, the ministry regulation about the priority of uh, how to use the village fund and it is uh, quite uh, straightforward actually the instruction from the ministry that the village should allocate some money to uh, develop infrastructure related things to the a waste management actually but um, we know as well from from uh, my own research that even though the the government asked the village to develop such an infrastructure but because uh, the decision of uh, how to use the money is based on the participatory decision making so it is also depend on whether or not the community propose uh, uh, some uh, a, a kind of proposal to develop such a project. So did you have a chance to check whether the, the community proposed such a project in the uh, village development planning and budgeting? And, and if you have a chance to check the, the, the document, can you see that if the government, the village government accommodates such a proposal? Thank you. Thank you, Mohamed Shukri. Uh, it is a very important question because I wanted to ask you the same question uh, last week uh, during your presentation. Uh, I wanted to know what uh, what uh, the participatory uh, decision making was uh, in in terms of uh, waste management. That means that I didn't have a chance to observe this. Uh, that's mainly because the village where I work was a they didn't have a the village head, so they were in a transition, 
and they had appointed one uh, until until the new election and and there was a collection service already in the in the village where I worked so they had decided previously I tried to find I tried to get information how how uh, this was uh, how did they come together to decide that we're going to spend money on on our ways being sent to landfill? No one could really tell me, but it was during, uh, during uh, everyone was giving me different answers. But uh, some people were saying it was more uh, about women actually making the decision. But I couldn't find out exactly if that if that was the case because I wasn't there at that meeting. But it was during the, uh, the yearly meeting deciding. Uh, deciding whether we should uh, spend money on that so it was made uh, it was it was decided as part of the this participatory meeting again but i wasn't there and as you say the funds are there the instructions might be there as well from the government but most of the villages in sumbawa don't have uh, don't see this as a priority so and also it's not the thing is lots of villages in in sumbawa they might have the funds and they could say okay we're going to deal with the base but and and w what you would normally do is you would get the um, you would you would buy a, a little truck and and talk to you know socialize the villages and say the, the householders and say that once a week we're going to collect uh, pick up your waste and take it to the landfill. But that was possible in a village where I worked. But in most uh, other villages, it's impossible because they are too far from the from the landfill. And I'm talking about I could take three, four, five hours. Uh, or even more depend on the uh, on the location of the village. So it is really it sometimes it catch twenty uh, twenty two when uh, someone telling you or you need you or you you understand yourself that you need to do something with the waste, but you don't know how to do it. Sorry, I couldn't really uh, answer you that question. In terms of my research, I mean, I know I know if if I had another go at it, I would certainly explore more channels this time. Okay. Yeah. Sorry. sorry. Did you else? have more? No. Okay. <laughs> okay. Uh, Lynn, would you like to ask your question? Sure. Hi, Lucas. It's nice to see um, It's funny how we all ask our questions, you know, based on our own interests. <laughs> so here I go. Um, I'm, I'm really interested in kind of what might be the relation between, well, maybe it's the mentality is the link, but between material waste and people as waste so there's this sort of moral panic about you know like people who take drugs for instance mm -hmm. and i'm wondering if you can sort of you suggested that there's some sort of link and i don't know whether it's that people are drawing metaphors or, or what i mean for me if we're thinking about sort of good moral citizens well i would I say I would like to see Indonesia sort of use their citizenship discourse to say that good moral citizens are the people who are responsible with their waste. But but I don't really hear this very much. And I'm just wondering how you see that relation between material waste and managing it, um, and zero waste and so on, and the people's waste. Okay, thanks. Thank you, Lynn. It's, uh, as you know, I'm trying to... Uh, Explore this in my thesis. I haven't really spent much time to to, to probe this analytically in terms of my data. But uh, as I mentioned in the text, uh, in, in the text I read earlier uh, on my presentation, this this why did I mention? It? Sorry, uh, the, the the connection between people as waste and the material waste is not really explore. Is not very is not made explicit. Uh, at least it wasn't in my field site with the people I talked. But when you're looking at the activities of what people actually do a part of the, as part of their campaigns, as I, for example, quoted uh, one teacher who said, uh, it's about um, uh, the religious piety, it's about character building, and so on. So it's not about the, the waste itself, it's about making sure that the, the students or those participating in those activities themselves won't become a waste. Uh, in Indonesia, there's a term called Sampa Masyarakat, which translates as, a, as, a, as people as waste. Uh, it's not in a sense that they are, well, yeah, it could be in a sense that they are a surplus in a way because they not participating in the, in the collective effort, which in this case is the cleanup activities. Okay, but now the problem is with waste, but you know, not being useful for society could just mean painting the village 
in a bright colors because there's a dignitary coming uh, to visit. So it doesn't have to be uh, related to, to waste, it's, uh, to material waste. But uh, in order for one not to become waste in the eyes of the other is to, it's not to be individualistic. That, that's, that's the simple narrative, uh, how we often understand it. Uh, you know, becoming a person in Indonesia is, is through social practice. So if, if you kind of deviate from it, that's, that's one way you could be seen as a, as, a, as a waste. There's also, I'm trying to also draw the link between the informal waste pickers as no longer being needed. They're still being needed, but somehow they, they uh, I wouldn't kind of equate them to, to Douglasian dirt, but they, um, they, are kind, they kind of go against the, the, the modern narrative of development. If, if you if, if if you want to say, um, and in terms of good moral citizens, in terms of uh, waste management, I think Sumbawa is just different to to, for example, Java or perhaps Bali or 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 other more developed or also tourist places. Uh, in terms of this effort to address the problem of waste, I think there are more campaigns are being being carried out and also. So I think there are people already starting to think that we have to do something because of the neighborhood where they live. So again, here the problem is not littering. Here the problem is not going to, to participate in cleanup activities. But in other, com in other communities, for example, in urban areas in, ja in Jakarta, it is possible that neighbors will, will, wouldn't agree with you uh, burning a vase or throwing it in, uh, in rivers. So that, you, know, you would have this kind of a Foucauldian being watched by your neighbors a situation, but it's not what I've seen in Sumbawa. In Sumbawa, it's more uh, oriented to, as I say, to to conform, but not to do with waste. If that answers your question, Lynn. Yeah, it's great. Thank you. And also, if I can, and also if I can uh, point one thing, I, I just mentioned the cleanup activities, but what's happening in 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 one one city in Java now, students. Uh, from high school, should go and spend a week. Bill has been um, uh, put out of uh, operation because it's full. But they now recycling whatever is left there to, to make in uh, up pellets for you know waste to energy technologies. So they they send male male students there to work with the informal waste pickers there who are kind of semi employed to 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 reclaim whatever is there, and. You know, as, I, as my research also looking at the edu waste related education, I was wondering whether actually, you know, like whether they use it in a way to teach about the problem, about because you know, uh, landfill itself itself is a great great resource. I mean, here in Australia we use landfills, but no one ever see one. No one ever often know where they are located and how the, how does it operate and so on. So they could be a good educational resource. But again, when you read when you when when I read uh, what the teachers say about it, it's just about you know, teaching the students to be thrifty, to save money, to think about their fellow citizens, but never it is about the problem of waste that is being buried uh, there. Okay, good, thank you. Um, does anyone else have a question? I do not see a new hand, but you may raise your hand if you wish. Um, if not, Loretta, did you want to follow up on your question? Um, yeah, okay. Um, thank you. Um, well, I, this relates to um, nicely, actually, to the previous questions and answers. Um, what, what your talk reminded me of was um, an earlier and completely um, debunked or uh, disputed um, theory to explain uh, waste mismanagement and litter in Italy, which was Banfield's notion of amoral familism, that um, these um, local communities in Italy were happy to um, let their environments get very cluttered up with litter, but they took great care of their private spaces and their households. And this was because they were familistic, and so it was defined in cultural terms and, um, you know, while they were very careful about notions of purity and cleanliness in their own homes and within their own families, they didn't care about 
the collective spaces. Um, of course, that's been completely debunked because of this issue of infrastructure, right, and government involvement and whether people have capacity to um, look after their environment because it's not possible for them to do it on their own. And, you know, it's not, it's not the fault of culture and not the fault of individual responsibility. Although, um, you know, elements of mentality are certainly relevant in this history in Italy um, because it's actually only relatively recent that people are required to pick up to pick up after their dogs, for example. Um, but um, when I lived in Italy not long ago, I was kind of impressed with the complexity of the recycle system. You know, the half of your kitchen is devoted to three different bins and, you know, different days for collection. And But anyway, I just wanted to, it's a comment really, that it right. reminds, you're grappling with issues that remind me of this, um, this earlier kind of um, debunked notion in the Italian case. So, okay. Yeah. Thanks, Loretta. That, that's that's interesting. I never thought of. Uh, I never read anything on on Italy. I'm sure I, I know there's there's some literature on Greek uh, Greece uh, waste management and and also the the problems of infrastructure there nowadays. But yeah, I, that's that's what my my research is looking at about this cultural assumption on one hand and this lack of infrastructure, and and also and 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 in a way kind of using the the the, the model or the, the the circular economy buzzword to to almost don't get don't don't let the government being involved and just you know using the it's just like a neoliberal tool that circular economy for people to just just do it themselves in a way. And that's what I'm trying to say that there are limitations because many, many materials, many waste materials that we use, a majority of them are unrecyclable. So the problem is that they will just continue to end up in, a, in the ocean. Um, in terms of, yeah, no, there's also, the, the, there are also cases where, where littering is a part of, could be seen as a, as a response to some inequality or injustice in a society, I'm sure. So uh, you might read uh, the case in South Africa where people living in a camp so not actually have a proper access to sanitation. They were just given these portable toilet units. And what they did, they just took them and drove to Johannesburg or I don't know which city it was and just dumped their pieces in uh, at the town hall. So it could be used as a, 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 in response to that. Uh, as you say, Some, about something similar happens in Napoli. Okay, yeah, possibly. When, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I'm sure it, 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 it's more effective than going somewhere with the placards if you actually urinate somewhere. It's, it's, it's more, I just think about uh, uh, Mary Douglas about a matter being out of place. Nothing is more out of place than, uh, than, uh, than that in, in the way we understand uh, clean lines and order. Um, yeah, there was something else I wanted to say, but it's, it's gone now, I think. Thank you, Son. Thank you for coming to rescue twice. All right. Okay, thank you for that, um, Loretta and Lucas. Um, in the chat, Lucas, there has been an interesting discussion about um, a book called Wasted Lives. Bauman. Yes. Oh, you are familiar with it. There you go. <laughs> Putting it uh, away, but I have to read it now. Mm. Yeah, thank you for that. Yeah, thanks for reminding everyone, whoever it was. Um, I think it was Sam. Sam, yeah. Yes. Thanks, Sam. Yeah. So, yeah. Um, are there any more questions? We do